What uh, Carter's showing you up here on the screen now is this spray. And uh, that's what fiber optics will do for you. If you put a light source here at one end, that light will show out the other end. Fiber optics, as we use it probably every day in our lives today, is used for communications. Our telephones work with fiber optics. Our computers work with fiber optics to send the data. But as model railroaders, we can use it to send light. And uh, if you can look down at the engines, you'll see that light. And also, uh, someplace around here, I had another one, but I don't know what it did with it. It was going to show a... I guess it's hanging over the table here. Here it is. This is what a, an LED looks like lit up. And I'm sure all of you know that because you've worked with those two legs. This is a bright white. You don't want to use bright LEDs. You want to use diffused lights when you do this because a bright LED gives you an aura around the light rather than just a pure spot for the light. But that's what it looks like when it comes out two, LED, two uh, fiber optics cables. And that's what's on the back of the uh, Rock Island caboose. Of course, it's got a resistor and a couple of wires. But uh, before we go into showing you how to put all this stuff together to do this, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, fiber optics. The, the, you're looking at the trailing engine. A, B, A, this is the trailer and it lights up red going forwards. When I reverse the direction for these engines, yeah, it worked part way, but it, but it didn't work on this one. It did work on this one. This one turned red and that one went out. There it goes, now it's working. So if you go the other direction, this way, you got white with a white headlight going forward. And in reverse, you got white with white headlight going backwards. If you reverse it, you see the red on the other end. So it's working right now like it's supposed to. But when you buy an engine today, unless you pay three, 400 bucks for it, you don't get lighted markers. Years ago, when you bought a uh, Proto 2000, you got lighted markers on some of the engines. Some of the other ones didn't have it. But if you wanted to add them, you had to go through quite a process to do that because all the electronic stuff to make them run and make them go right for the right direction weren't available back when. But, but all that stuff's available now. So it's nice to have that. It's nice to be able to do it. And what I'm going to do is next is show you how to do it. Carter, let's advance some slides here. You want to go past the caboose and come up with the color marker meaning slide, the meaning of color markers. I think most of you guys know that we probably don't use lights on engines anymore to indicate the sections of the train because everything's controlled through TCS or TCC, you know, control signaling from the uh, places like Florida and so forth, wherever the home office for the railroad is. But back in the old day, uh, the guys out in the various towers needed to look at the locomotive to see what section it was that was coming through. And the uh, first section of a multiple unit train that had you know several sections was usually green. And then that any train that followed that was a white. And that way the guys up in the tower knew what was passing them and uh, they kept everything in order that way. So I don't use green. And the reason I don't use green is because it doesn't show up very well on the front of the engine. It's very dull. You have to look twice to even make sure it's on. So I don't mind being in the second section. I use white. Okay. And Matt? If there's only one section, is it white in that case? Yes. The uh, other color I use, of course, is red, and that indicates the end of the train. I like to put them on the back of the engine as well as on the back of the B unit. That way I know everything's working when it's going around the track and everything's 
like it's supposed to be. So if you're like me, you model in the transition period, lighted marker lights is something you might want to look into. And it's not that hard to do. Next slide, Carter. <clears throat> Shown on the board up here are the components that it takes to make one of these assemblies. And uh, I'm gonna show you how to put it all together. That's what it looks like in real life without the fiber optics on it. And we'll get to that phase in just a minute. But uh, next slide, Carter. When you start out, well, before we do that, let me tell you about the uh, materials. You got the materials? Oh, okay. The materials aren't really that hard to come by except for fiber optics. Uh, if you guys think you might wanna do this, stop by at the end of this presentation and I'll whack you off some. That'll make it real easy for you to come by some fiber optics. Cause if you go on eBay, There'll be some there, but it won't be the size you want to use. Usually it's bigger and use that for headlights or for other applications. I got this out of a Christmas picture. It was being used to light up the stars in the background behind the church. And my wife no longer wanted it since it quit blinking. She didn't like it when it didn't blink. It stayed on steady. How long she... did it take you to make it not blink? <laughs> <laughs> four years <laughs> i really liked the picture i wanted to put it up every year but she didn't like it so finally i destroyed it took it apart and saved this part of it just to show you what fiber optics look like lit up but you could actually take your scissors and whack one of those off and use it just like i'm going to do here in a little bit but if you go online or if you go to a to a hobby store and look around you can usually find fiber optics and you're looking for 028.028. George? Yes. Uh, there's a company named Dwarven that some of you may have heard of that uses fiber optics for lighting and they, they sell several diameters of fiber optics. I can't tell if they have 028 in particular. They were just bought by another frames, I think. Uh, that ends in a Z instead of an S, I think just acquired them, but, but uh, they might also be a source for fiber optics but as george says you want to check the size the diameter micro mark cells fiber optic yes good so the reason why you use 028 is because it's the right size for what you're doing here for ho and you'll understand more about that as we progress the other reason you use 028 is because you use an, an 030 drill bit to drill the hole in the shell but you need some two-way tape. You need some wire. And I use TCS wire, train control systems wire. A couple of reasons. One, it takes solder very well. And I use uh, 6040, 2% rosin core solder. It solders very well. And also it's extremely flexible, which is what you need when you go to cram all that stuff inside a shell. <laughs> the reason I use three colors is not because I'm patriotic, red, white, and blue. It's because red, white, and blue is part of the International Model Railroad standard for decoder wiring. Those of you that have installed decoders know that blue is common, used for all your lights. You know that red goes to the right rail to pick up your positive power from the track. You know that white goes to the headlight because white is always the headlight. The other colors that, that you would use are uh, yellow for the backup light, uh, black for the left rail, and orange and uh, gray for the motor. So follow the standard. The other reason for following the standard is, is when you get ready to hook all this stuff to your decoder, you won't drive yourself nuts by using all black wire or all white wire trying to figure out what the end of the wire goes to. You'll know because you got the color where it goes. Yeah. 
So spend the bucks, buy the wire, and you'll be in business. <clears throat> You're going to need some matches. I use just regular old stick matches. You're going to need some resistors. And you can take your choice. You can use 470 for a brighter light, 680 for a little stronger light, or 1K uh, for, for, for a little dimmer light. And uh, it's up to you what you want to use. You get multiple opportunities to look at how bright your light is as you're going through this process. And if you want to change resistors as you're building these assemblies, that's the time to do it. Don't wait till you get it in the engine and put it on the track and you say, oh my gosh, that's too bright or that's too dull. I can't see it. Work on it while you're coming through your through your process. <clears throat> Out of those three, which one do you recommend? I like bright lights. Just like I'm hard of hearing, I like loud sounds. And so I run all my engines at full blast. <laughs> yeah, <me too>. Okay. <laughs> The other thing you're gonna need is some fiber optics. And I get this from eBay, and I think I've bought probably a dozen of these so far. And they're kits. The kit is made up of six different sizes of seven different colors. And the sizes are 1 16th. Are you up with me, Carter? Hey, George, you said fiber optics. Do you mean LEDs? No, uh, fiber optics. That's huge. Each Heat shrink, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I keep, I do this thing and I keep quitting, forgetting to turn the pages. Okay. Have the page up that's got the uh, heat, shrink heat shrink tubing. There you go. And it tells you right there on the screen where this comes from, or I think it does. Hickory yeah, Hickory, Hickory Tube Works. All you gotta do is, is, is search Hickory Tube Works on eBay and it'll come up. And uh, like I said earlier, it comes in six different sizes and seven different colors. One, one sixteenth, three thirty seconds, one eighth, three sixteenth, quarter and three eighths. And uh, believe it or not, you'll use all of those except for the, the three eighths, putting one of these things together. So it's good to have the kit rather than try to fuss around with, with, with sizes, odd sizes that don't work. <clears throat> you're going to need solder we talked about that two-way tape because when you get all this stuff in the shell of a locomotive it's good to, to stick it to the ceiling because these covered wagons are curved and there's a little bit more room up there above your weight above your speaker and above your uh, decoder where you can where you can have some room to put this stuff. Also notice that I've left the, the legs of the uh, fiber optics long when I put the assembly inside the shell. The reason for that is, is because when you go to hook that shell back up to your engine, your, your motor and stuff, you don't have a whole lot of room in there because of the, the uh, weight and the uh, <clears throat> speaker and the decoder. So if you've got them tucked up there out of the way, it'll help you get things back together. Plus you leave them long because if you've made a mistake in where you put them, you can pick them off the two-way tape and move them back and forth. If you cut them off when you put them in there and put your blister on the end of it for your lens, and then you decide later you have to move it, guess what? You're screwed. You gotta start over again and put new fiber optics that's longer back in your assembly so that you can move it to where you want it to be so you can get the shell back on. Carter, let's start with uh, the shell preparation. Switch over a slide or two on beyond tools and materials and go to shell preparation. Well, before you get there, you're gonna see a picture of the uh, backup one, yeah. If you guys don't have a good soldering outfit, get one. All of you at our age have spent $25, $30, probably four or five times buying those cheap single underpowered soldering irons that, that uh, 
year and a half, two years later, you pitch in the garbage can, you go try to find a new one. Stop it. Go buy a decent one and pip spend 50 or 60 bucks for one that'll last you a while and one that also comes with a heat gun because you're going to use that heat gun to shrink your uh, tubing. You owe it to yourself. Get one. Okay, go ahead, Carter. First thing you got to do to get your shell ready to uh, receive all this stuff is file a flap on the blister on the shell. All of you have seen these shells. You all probably got one. It's got a blister out there that's supposed to look like a, a uh, marker light. And if you're like me back in the old days, you probably put a dot of silver paint on it or white paint on it. So it looked more like a headlight than in this case, a red, orange, and silver marker light. And what you do is you file that off. Not all of it, but most of it. And you have to be careful filing it. I like to put my thumb over the number board so that I can run the file against my thumb rather than taking the paint off the top of the marker or the top of the uh, number board. But just go across it three or four times, take a look at it, and see if it's created a flat spot. Well, what do you need a flat spot for? Have you ever started to try started to try a drill with a thirty thousandths drill bit on a curved surface? Mm -hmm. It walks off every which direction. You can't get it started. Okay, so file your flat spot. Be careful. Don't ruin your paint job. Next slide, Carter. Next thing you do is you take uh, your X-Acto knife, find the center of that flat spot, which will be real easy to find because you still got some raised material from the factory injection molding on the sides. Find your flat spot, find the center of it, and put a real sharp X-Acto blade on it, push on it, and then twist it back and forth. This will give you a little bit of countersink, a little bit of of place to start your drill. Next slide, Carter. <laughs> Back from my days in Delco Remy, I ended up with a go no gauge. I took the no go off because it was a green section. It was just like the red section. And I use it with other size bits. But what it does is it helps me capture as a collet the 030. 030 uh, drill. You can use other collets, but if you've ever tried to chuck up a 30 thousandths drill in a DeWalt drill, you know it don't work. It won't hold it. It won't go down that fine to grab that small bit. So you need some kind of a collet, some kind of an interface in there to grab the bit. And when you got it, set it in your, your detent that you made with your X-Acto knife Make sure you got a little bit of pressure on it so it doesn't jump out and scratch your paint and start your drill and drill your hole. You drill both holes on both sides. And also, if you're going to put lights on the back end of the thing, you need to do the same thing. It's already flat, so all you have to do is find out where you want your hole, score it, and drill it. Don't put your hole so, so high that you're drilling into the roof. Don't put your hole so wide that you're drilling into the side because there's no way to get fiber optics through them if you drill into your roof or you drill into your side. Come down and in where you're going through so that you can find it on the inside of the shell. Also, you see that there's a couple of lights back here molded into the shell. Don't use them. Two reasons. One, your weight is in the road of your fiber optics. And the other reason is, is that uh, the decoder or something else will probably be in the road down there like your speaker. You got to figure out how to get your fiber optics around your speaker to show out through the back of the unit. If you want to, you could probably drill 
and fuss with them and, and make them light up white and then put them on one of the F3, F4, F5, or F6 terminals instead of your headlight wire or your backup wire and then make them light when you want to think like they're getting out and getting into the B unit for some reason, they need a light to see what they're doing. You can do that if you want to. I've, ne I've never done it. I just sort of ignore those bumps. <clears throat> Anyhow, once you get your holes drilled, next slide, Carter. Don't forget to take, take your drill bit out because when you set a drill down and you knock it over, it goes to its heaviest point and that breaks your bit. You, you got enough expense in this day and age without buying new bits every time you knock your drill over. Been there, done that, and I know you guys have also. So take your drill out, set it aside, and when your drill falls over, it won't ruin your bit. Go to the next slide, Carter. <clears throat> this is a 1 16th inch drill bit, and you use it, but don't use it in your drill. Don't put it in your drill. What it's used for is to put a chamfer in your drilled hole. Put a chamfer in both the ones on the back and chamfer the front one so deep that most all of that injection molded bump goes away. When you start to see it just start to disappear, stop. Because what you wanna do is you wanna create a pocket, a chamfered pocket inside that shell so that when you finally do your final assembly by cutting off your excess that's sticking out about an eighth of an inch long, lighten it up with a match so that it puts a blister on the end of it. And you got it sticking out there about an eighth of an inch from where it needs to be. Then you take, while it's still warm, piece of stainless steel and drive it home into that chamfer. Then when you look at it, it looks like a lens on some kind of an electrical box, which is what you're after. You're looking for some kind of realistic look, okay? And if you chamfer it in there, it does give you that realistic look. <clears throat> if you don't chamfer it, it's going to stick out. After the presentation's over, you can come up here and look at this caboose. They stick out on this caboose. And the reason they stick out is because if your eyes are good enough, you can see it's got pre-molded lanterns on it. What I did was I scored it with my X-Acto knife after filing it flat and started my drill. And just after I was sure my drill was started good, rather than drilling straight through the lantern, I drilled at, a, at an angle so that the drill bit would come out inside the caboose. Then what I did was I cut it off to length and lighted it up with a match. And while it was still hot, I took and pressed it into the lantern at a 90 degree angle. So that little fiber optic goes into that little lantern straight like a lens is supposed to look like. And then it turns 90 degrees and comes inside the caboose. Now, how long does it take for the fiber optic to cool so that it solidifies? How long do you have to do that? Instantly. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get it, don't worry about it. Just pull it back out and start over again because you've got a little bit of extra that you've left on it, like I've showed you, that sticks out. It cools very rapidly. It takes a little while to heat it. and uh, But it sets up pretty quick. It cools off faster than it heats up. We'll get into some of that here in just a little bit. Where are we, Carter? Yeah, right there, right where you are. Drilling in the chamfer. Next slide. This picture shows you this shell with these fiber optics cords sticking out of it. And I've already told you the reason why I leave them long so that you can make adjustment. Next slide, Carter. This shows you the end of the B unit 
it's not the B unit that's going around. It's a different one that I didn't bring. But it shows you that you've also got the flat surface, and all you need to do is score it with your exacto knife, then drill your hole, chamfer it, and you're ready for your fiber optics. Go ahead, next slide, Carter. <clears throat> I don't remember why I put that slide in there. We already talked about it. I would I would say it, it's a good one that shows where you put your actual holes way up high instead of in the molded on pockets. Yeah. If you drill any higher than that, you're going to be into the roof and you can't get your fiber optics through it. If you drill any further towards the outside, you're going to be into the side of the shell. And again, you can't get your fiber optics through it. Next slide. That shows you all the materials that you need to prep ahead of time to do your assemblies. Actually, there's two assemblies there. One assembly is uh, what's needed to do your fiber optics and how you trap it inside the heat shrink. The other assembly is how you do your wiring and your resistors to your LEDs. And these LEDs are special. They've got three legs. So you don't wanna use a two leg and try to get two different colors out of it. It won't work. And the reason I'm showing you two LEDs on there is because I'm doing both front and back of the engine. We'll get into wiring here in a little bit to show you how the wiring is done and how it connects to the uh, decoder. But before we go there, I need to show you how to put these assemblies together and, and uh, tell you a couple, couple of do's and don'ts that you're gonna get into as a result of working with this stuff. Also, it's very important to test these next two steps so that you know that you got things right as you go. But the way you start out, next slide. The way you start out is with two pieces of fiber optics, make them long so you can get something to get a hold of, so you got something to move in the locomotive if you're not positioned correctly to get the shell back on. And then to that, you add a 1 8th inch no, one sixteenth inch piece of fiber optics. Just slip it over there and you can leave about an eighth of an inch sticking out of the shrink wrap tubing. Line them up so that they're both even. Then when you got that done, grab your soldering iron. I should say your clean soldering iron because you don't want to use a dirty soldering iron to do this, because if you leave some solder on this fiber optics, sooner or later, it's going to come loose and fall off. And when it goes down into your gears, you're going to wonder why your locomotive stopped. So use a clean, clean soldering iron. Also, lay this thing down on something flat when you do it. Do not use this. This is too hot. And what happens to you when it's too hot, it crinkles your assembly. This will still show light, but not as much as you get if you make a clean assembly. And it also gives you a problem because it's kinked up when you go to try to put it in the engine. It wants to go where you don't want it to go and it wants to stick up and bother something else that's in its road. So you have to kind of mash it in there. So don't do this. Just take your scissors and whack it off and start over again with your one eighth inch piece. You got plenty of material, just go ahead and work with it. Uh, but anyhow, to keep it from doing that, yeah. Time check, the library closed at five, we need to be cleaned up and out by then. So oh yeah, yep, yep, we're getting, we're getting on to it now. So anyhow, when you do this with your soldering iron, lay it down on a flat surface and hit all four sides of it. To check it when you're done, make sure that you can't pull it off of there. Make sure it stays. 
And then it's time for your first test. Stick it to a light assembly and look at the ends of it and see how it's lit, it's lit up. You see how it lights up? You wanna make sure you have a uniform light on both, both pieces of, of fiber optic cord. If you don't have a uniform light, there's probably two reasons for it. One is, is that you're not even back here or you've cut them at an angle and one's picking up more light than the other one. If that's the case, just take your scissors and whack it off. Don't start over again, just whack it off. Check it again, see if you like your light pattern. If you still don't like your light pattern, look at the other end and you probably got uh, uneven assembly. Whack it off, check it again, make sure it's straight across. Stick it back to your light assembly and make sure you got two lights coming out of there that are, that are right. Because if they're not right, the only way to correct it is to take everything apart. And you don't want to do that after you got it in your engine. You want to fix it now before you put it in the engine. So when you're satisfied with your light source, that it's picking up and emitting the light the way it's supposed to be, you're ready to go on to the second part of this assembly which is to put an additional piece of, of uh, shrink wrap tubing on that assembly. And the reason you need an additional piece of uh, shrink wrap tubing on that assembly is because if you look at the diameter of your lead, you see that it's bigger than the diameter of your, of your fiber optics. You wanna increase that size so that it gets up pretty close to what the size of the LED is so that when you put another piece of shrink wrap tubing over the two to marry them, that it'll shrink down and properly hold the two together so they don't come apart. So did you get the next slide, Carter? Mm -hmm. The next slide shows you that additional piece and I've used red instead of black so that when I look at it, I know that it's got the two on there. So I can see both the red and the black. Go ahead to the next slide. May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing at five o'clock tonight. The time is now four thirty. Thank you. Try to hurry up here so we get done in time. For this next part of the presentation, I'm going to show you how to put the second part of that assembly together. First thing you need to do is trim the legs of your LED. Shorten them up. Center is blue. You can leave it any length you want that you think you can deal with. But since space is at a premium inside a LED for a uh, DCC engine, you want to make them short. I usually leave my center lead about a half inch long. The next longest length lead is the red side of the LED. I cut it down also. But then when I go to the white side of the LED, I cut it down a little bit shorter so that as I'm looking at this thing, I know which one's red and which one's white, okay? Then to save time, I'm gonna jump ahead here a little bit, Carter. You're gonna to have to forward some of the slides to maybe catch up with me. Go to this one that's got the... Uh, insulation on it yep you want to do this come over we'll do one that's what i'm going to do i'll call you okay anyhow what you're looking at is additional sizes and additional pieces of uh, fiber optics material or uh, not fiber optics but uh, uh, heat shrink tubing that's been placed as an insulator on your assembly where you assembled your resistor to the leg of the diode. And you put that on there for two reasons. One is to insulate it so that it doesn't get against something inside your engine and short your engine out. The other reason you put it on there is this stuff when it shrinks adds strength to that assembly. Uh, you can actually put this together without soldering it and you can get enough shrink to make an electrical connection to make it work. The only problem with that is when you pull on it, it'll come apart. So solder it. 
But anyhow, I used the extra set of hands to do that. And keep it away from your metal because you're going to be soldering to the metal and so forth. So you don't want to have to move it every time you want to solder something. Stick it right to the lens, the plastic lens. If you've got a, something like this or some way of holding it, unless you wind it up in a vise and really crank on it, you're not going to break that front off that LED anyway. It'll hold it. And so that you lets yourself free with two hands to do what you need to do next, which is I'm sure you're already ahead of me, is to add the wires. And you got three wires to add. Red, white, and blue. Not to be patriotic, but to follow the NMRA standard and make sure you're not driving yourself nuts. Next slide. <clears throat> This is the marriage slide. What you're doing is you're marrying your LED with your fiber optic assembly. And to do that, you take a piece of one eighth uh, uh, shrink wrap tubing, stick it over the head of your LED and it'll stay there if you shove it all the way on. If you use a smaller size, like the 330 seconds, the best you'll be able to do with that little lubrication is to get it part way on. You can keep fussing with it until you get it all the way on, but you need to take a little bit of uh, uh, super glue, just touch a little spot of it on there or it mates up with your LED assembly and stick it so that it won't fall off because you got some work to do with it and you want it to stay in place. So if you've got the kit, just cut the bigger size and make it about three quarters of an inch long. Then what you do is you stick your fiber optic assembly in there. Go to the next slide, Carvin. But what I do with this one is I use the, the big gun and I hold it back here so I don't burn my fingers. But I aim it such that the heat stays away from the fiber optic cables because you don't want to melt those and kink them all up. Not at this point. You've got too much time in it to mess it up. So hold your gun down so that it shoots up the, the black strip because you want to shrink it against the LED assembly and also have it shrink up against the fiber optic assembly. And when you get done, check it. See if you can pull it apart because you've got quite a bit of manipulation to do to get it into the shell and you don't want it falling apart on you when you try to assemble it. But it's critical that you test your assemblies. I've bought packages of, of three millimeter common anode LEDs and get to this stage and find out that one side doesn't work. So make a test. Again, hook your common up, hook to one side or the other, make sure you got a white light if you're on the white wire, and make sure you got a red light if you're on the red wire. And yeah, Sometimes you'll find that one of them's burnt out already or doesn't work or didn't work in the factory. And I don't know why that is. Back when I worked at Delco Remy, they talked about infant mortality for electronics. And, and you'll get to experience that doing this because sooner or later, if you do enough of these, you're going to find one that don't work. But not only test this assembly, but test this assembly like I showed you earlier. Make sure that it shows a uniform light coming through both cables. If it's not uniform, trim them on both ends, start over and check it again. And don't be afraid to cut it down a little bit because you still got plenty to work with. But after you've got your marriage done, you need to wire the, the two together if you're doing both ends of your locomotive. And of course you hook your blue together, blue to blue, and you hook a red to a white and the other red to a white. That way it gives you 
the front and back of the locomotive. The one that's got the white wire going to the front should go to the white wire, the headlight wire of the locomotive. That way, when you're going forward, it'll light up white. At the same time it's lighting up white, you got current coming through the red wire going to the other LED that lights it up red, okay? So when you hit your button to change the direction, you got white on the back and red on the front, but you're going the other direction, you're going backwards, okay? Now we'll get into wiring and that'll finish up the uh, presentation. <clears throat> Bring up, eh, that's all right, we'll start there. There's two ways to do the wiring. One is like I've already told you a couple of times, keep it simple. Just hook it to your headlight wire, your white wire, and your backup light, the yellow wire. You don't have to program anything because when you're running forward, the nature of that decoder is, is to turn your headlight on. If you've got your, your what is it, your F, uh, F8 button on for to, to run your headlights. Headlight. And the same way you got your tail light on if you're hooked to the yellow wire. There's no programming to do. And uh, the other way, of course, to do it then is to hook it up to your F3, F4, F5, and F6 terminals on your uh, decoder. And if you're using an old uh, TCS decoder from two or three years ago. Don't use F5 or F6. I did, and it didn't work because every time I'd put my engine back on the track or start it up again from a dead siding, like I like it happened to me here earlier in this presentation, I didn't have any lights. I had to go through F3 and turn them back on again. And so I called up. TCS back when they had a live person at the end of the phone wire instead of making you send a email all the time about your problems. I got to talk to a guy and he said, no way. And I said, no, I've fooled with this thing long enough and I've done enough of these to know that that doesn't work. Whatever it is inside that decoder doesn't keep it latched so that it turns back on the next time. Just like you saw it was out with me here this morning. presentation I fired it up and it was on and he said well let me check on that I got a call about three days later and they said George we're sending you a brand new decoder not that there's anything wrong with the one you got but we're sending you to this decoder and thanks for finding a problem we didn't know we had and back then it was an $83 decoder now it's 103 if you can find them at 103 sometimes they're 120 and up so I was thankful for that but if you're hooking to a TCS decoder and you're using one with, with wires, uh, just go to your headlight white wire and go to your yellow wire, your reverse wire. And, but if you don't decide to do that, if you're afraid to do that, if you've got other things hooked to your headlight wire and you think you're gonna overdo the circuit, blow something up, go to your pink, brown, and, uh, purple and green wires, hook them, hook them there. And in the case where you're doing both and you got them wired together, hook, hook one to say purple and the other one to green. Doesn't make any difference where you hook them, just hook them there. But remember where you hook them because you're gonna need to know that because you got a little bit of programming to do for those circuits to make them function correctly when you fire up your locomotive. In other words, like I had to do here this morning or this afternoon, I had to go into light mode and turn them back on again. Not only did I have to turn them back on, but I had to program it earlier when I put this assembly into the decoder to know where it was, whether it was on F3, F4. I never use F5 or F6 again because I don't know what brand of decoder I got, whether I got an old one or a new one when I buy one off of eBay. So I stay away from F5 and F6. Same way if you're wiring to, bring the other one up, Carter. Same way if you're wiring to a uh, soundtracks decoder, you got the motor, motor leads up here, positive and negative. Down here, you have your light function and your speaker. And so you need to pick one, F3 or F4, 
F5 or F6, because they don't have this, the TCS problem, you can go ahead and use those. But remember where you put them, write it down someplace. And a good place to write it down is on Decoder Pro in your comment sections where you made your wire connection so you know which one's which. Because later on, after six months of having that thing sit around, you're going to forget where you put them. And if you need to do something, you need to know where they are rather than ripping the shell off and taking, taking a look. Because these shells aren't easy to get back on when you got all that stuff crammed in there. Like you can see on this shell, it's got LED headlights as well as a, an LED uh, Mars light. And if you've got an engine with a Mars light, you can't use the white headlight wire because in reverse uh, or, or in uh, forward, you want it blinking by itself and not controlled by the, the, the forward and reverse motion of the engine. So you, so you, you have to, no choice. You've got to hook it to F3, F4, or F5, or F6. And you've got to program it to, to get it to work. But if you're using a Soundtracks decoder, it even gets more complicated. Because after you physically made the connection and soldered it to your board, you've got to go in and, and tell it how to work. And the way you do that, go to number two on the wiring, Carver. No, one more forward. Yeah. Soundtracks, F3, F4, F5, or F6. An A unit going forward, F3 for forward lights, program CV 1387 to 5 and 1388 to 10. That's on your lead unit. If you program it with the same numbers on this unit, it's not going to work right. You need to reverse the 5 and the 10. Mm. Make it 10 and 5 so that it's going the other direction. So you got a little more work to do if you're using uh, a Soundtracks decoder. Personally, I like to stay with the TCS decoders because they talk to me. <laughs> and uh, I can get there quicker where I need to be using their decoders instead of uh, Soundtracks. And also, TCS has got a better warranty. They've got the goof-proof warranty. Like if you burn one up like I did last week just by putting the engine on a live track, and destroy their decoder, as long as it's less than a year old, they'll replace it free. And I'm waiting for mine to come back to get my engine running again because I did that. Questions? Last slide. Like I said earlier, if you want to try this, I'll give you some fiber optics so you don't have to go hunting. You're going to have to hit TCS. Or, or lead switch or somebody to find your three-legged, three-millimeter diffused common anode diode. Don't use anything different. They don't work. You can't wire it up. You can't make it function. You have to use the, you can use a five millimeter if you want, but you're just eating up space inside your shell. Use a three-millimeter common anode diffused three-legged light, either red, green, or red, white. You can get other colors, but they don't match up with the railroad. Mm -hmm. Questions? Is that written on that package that you've yeah. got? Yeah, it is. I've got a handout here that I can give some of you. I can't, I don't have enough for everybody, but I can give you a handout that's got most of this information. If you're a mind to. Yeah, let me get one of